The new Mosquito Bomber, twin-engined, long-range, and made of wood. Officials of the de Havilland plant in Ottawa display the revolutionary construction and material of the new plane. The fuselage is made of two skins of plywood with an insulation of softer wood between. Answering the controversy of wood versus aluminum, in some cases the Mosquito has proved less vulnerable to gunfire than metal machines. The wings are formed of large sheets of supple wood, light, strong, and easily molded. The result is a high-speed reconnaissance bomber. Pictured for the first time, the Mosquito is wheeled from the hangar for a trial run. This new weapon is being built by the de Havilland Company as a result of a bottleneck in light metal material. Its engines are being made in American factories from English design. Unique in construction as well as material, the Mosquito is assembled in two pieces. The halves are then joined to make the body complete. This plane requires half the man hours needed for a similar plane of metal. It mounts four cannon and four machine guns. Test pilot de Havilland sets his controls ready for the takeoff. The Mosquito taxis down the field, picks up speed, and lifts from the ground like a chip in the wind. Viewed from the nose of the plane, the airport beneath is a fast disappearing streak. Its speed and climbing power are military secrets, but has been known to outdistance the Fox Wolf 190, indicating a maximum speed of 430 miles per hour. Slicing vapor trails with its wooden wingtip, the bomber does a slow loop. To a look off a rear gunner, its striking power is more like a timber wolf than a mosquito. With one motor cut, it can stunt like a fighter, maintaining perfect balance and efficiency of speed. In actual combat and attack, the mosquito has upheld the excellence of its trial run. A bomber made of wood has proved its metal. Milne Bay, on the tip of New Guinea Island, is an important harbor for the United Nations. If it had fallen into Japanese hands, our position at Fort Moresby would have been endangered, and the whole campaign to drive across New Guinea and capture Buna and Gona would have collapsed. The Japanese attempt to land the force at Milne Bay met with a decisive defeat. With the hull of the tip of New Guinea in the allied hands, it is possible for the cargo ships to dock in Milne Bay. From there, they discharge their valuable supplies, which are then shipped up country to the allied forces. However, it is necessary to send scouting parties up along the coast to seek out and mop up any isolated nests of Jap that might be holding out in the jungle. Jap landing barges were left on the beach put out of action by the pilots of the Kitty Hawk fighter plane. These steel barges carried 60 men and some mechanized equipment. Plowing through the daily rainstorm, the soldiers are wary and alert, always conscious that Jap snipers may be hidden in the underbrush or in the trees. But all the evidence they find points to a hasty and complete retreat. Abandoned tanks riddled by anti-tank fire. These important links in the supply chain, tanker trucks, are shot up and useless. 37 millimeter field guns were discarded by the Japs in their flight. They will now be turned against them. Bicycles have been used extensively by the Japs in all their campaigns from Malaya to New Guinea. One of the most interesting items found among the abandoned equipment is this garment, a bulletproof vest. The steel lining can deflect shrapnel, but is vulnerable to a direct hit. Their gas masks are cheaply constructed of flimsy material. Here is one of their typically broad, short bayonets. This soldier has put on one of the very practical two-toed rubber-soled shoes that Jap snipers use for tree climbing. According to the men who fought at Milne Bay, no praise is too high for the magnificent work of the Royal Australian Air Force Kitty Hawk Fighter Squadron. The pilots swept Japanese opposition from the sky, strafing landing barges, even coming low to pick off snipers from treetops. Deep in the jungle, our engineers have hacked out landing fields, but the rains keep the ground soggy and unusable.
where these steel mats were brought in to provide a firm strip for takeoff. From these small portable landing fields, our pilots take their planes into the daily offensive that is being waged to drive the Japs off the island of New Guinea. Many household appliances can no longer be purchased. Stores that once had well-stocked shelves are now empty, and some are forced to close. Kitchen utensils are now going into war production. Those that the housewife now has will have to last until the war is won. Some new parts, easy to install, are still available for home repair. And stockings, too, can now be mended at home with a simple device and a little patience. Cotton and wool also are vital war products. Instead of throwing these trousers away, expert workers take threads from the hem or seams and reweave the torn part. Small fixer shops are opening in many communities. Here, anything from a radio to a baby's rattle is accepted for repair. This vacuum cleaner will soon be overhauled and back in service again. Fashionable department stores also are opening Save It Service divisions. This electrical plant used to manufacture new goods. Unable to get many materials, it now turns to the repair of household equipment. Older, experienced workers mend all makes and all kinds of home appliances. Many schools have swung to teaching children household repairs in manual training classes. Students bring their own appliances from home. A vacuum cleaner that doesn't work. A toaster that blows fuses. But under competent guidance, these children are helping the war effort by learning to repair the household time saver. And in other schools, mothers and fathers are going back to the classroom once more, learning from competent teachers how to patch and mend. This teacher is explaining how to mend a screen with a simple patch purchased at any drugstore. Some people create a dangerous condition in their home when they put a penny behind a blown out fuse. This fuse now, instead of being the weakest point in the circuit, is the strongest point. This is a disastrous trick that ruins home wiring and often causes destruction by fire. Today's slogan is, fix it. Here is a record of the first American attack ever made on Italian soil in the long history of war. The date, December 4, 1942. The target, Naples. The crew of the Daisy May goes aboard, fully prepared with maps, weather reports, and knowledge of danger spots to be encountered. More than a score of United States liberators warm up for the takeoff from a field somewhere in North Africa. of the squadron is almost due north, over barren stretches of desert, then on out over the calm blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. The mission has great importance in the strategy of European warfare. Italy's heavy industries feeling the force of RAF bombing to the north have been moved to Naples for safety. The huge four-motored bombers spread across the sky over the Mediterranean. Several of the planes are veterans of other successful raids. For every enemy plane destroyed, a star is stenciled on the fuselage of the bomb. A ship is painted on for every enemy boat sunk. As dusk comes, the squadron approaches safely. Pilots climb up to high altitude, beyond the reach of anti-aircraft guns. Gunners are on the alert at all times.
From the tremendous height, the bombing is accurate and intensive. Oil refineries are smashed, sending up clouds of black and gray smoke. 100,000 pounds of explosives were dropped, sinking one cruiser, badly crippling one warship and another cruiser. The waterfront, harbor railway installations, and munitions dumps were left shrouded in smoke and flame. The raid on Naples, from which all American bombers returned, was brief, violent, and effective. <laughs> This is Arthur Hawking, plot number 2062, an American, a machinist for many years. Several months ago, a telegraph boy came to Arthur Hawking's door. And Arthur Hawking learned that his son was dead, killed in action. In the next few weeks, Arthur Hawking was puzzled. Many things look very different to him now. He thought about his sons and the sons of his friends. He felt he had something to say to his friend. And so, he wrote a letter. Seven weeks ago, my only son was killed in the war. Most of you know this, but you can't possibly know how hard his mother and I feel. That is, none of you except Walt Gardner, who just lost his boy, too. Since Hardy's death, I've been doing a lot of thinking. What I'm trying to figure out is why so many of us are taking things for granted and not doing all we can to help win the war. Maybe it's because we keep hearing and talking about the war lasting for years. That sort of thinking might keep anyone from hurrying. It could be that this long full stuff was why we lost almost half a million minutes of production time last month through absences and tardiness. Anyway, I'm fed up with all this talk about a five or ten year war. There's no sense to it. We can win this war quick. We've got to. If we don't, your boys will be killed like mine was. So put those five and ten year thoughts out of your head. Finish our refrigeration machines for the synthetic rubber program this month. Not next. Keep our portable cold storage line going 24 hours a day, not 16 or 20. Sure, this means sacrifices. It's no fun to work the night shifts. It's not easy to put 10% of your pay into war bonds. None of us go for gas and food rationing. These are nothing compared to losing someone you love. I know. Please, please don't wait for the casualty list to come rolling in. Throw yourselves into high, now. Get going as though both the Hun and the Jap had to be licked in 1943. I suggest a new slogan. Here it is. Let's get it over quick. I hope you won't think I'm preaching. I'm not. I'm praying. Yours truly, Arthur Hawking, clock number 